Good morning, everyone. We're so excited that you chose to tune in, to join us online. Um, just like most weeks, you know, we're gonna sing a couple more songs of worship. And worship is so much more than, than singing. It's, it's so much more than that. And there's a lot of things to focus on with worship, but today I wanna focus on trusting God. And I just wanna encourage you to do that with me. You know, as we sing these next couple songs, let's choose to trust God and put him first. You know, worship is about putting God first before anything. So that, that can mean putting him first before our fears and our anxiety and choosing to trust him. And yeah, that's a, you know way easier said than done. But the more we consciously choose to trust God, the more that sinks into our hearts and our minds and changes how we live. And, you know, instead of focusing on our fears, our anxieties, we focus on how big and amazing God is. And so I just want to encourage you as we sing these next couple songs, focus on who God is, how big he is, and just give your fears and your worries and give those to God. So before we sing these next couple songs, I'm just going to read uh, a couple verses from Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.
Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on the curse. I want you to hear the words of Jesus from Matthew 11, words of invitation. And they're in our uh, Bible reading this past week uh, as we read through the Bible in a year. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. 
take my yoke upon you. A yoke was what held two oxen together. So the images were, were, were tightly knit to Jesus and to the heart of Jesus and, and him to us. So he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Some of you need that today, I'm sure. And then verse 34, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We were talking about this in our pastor's meeting this past week of how to live in that place of the rest of Jesus, his rest and the burden being light in the world in which we live in. And we couldn't get away from the simple truth that it is about choosing daily to trust in Jesus and trust God for, for everything and in everything. And some of you need that encouragement today. And I'm gonna pray right now for you in your situation. And if there's something that is just, this resonates with you, open your heart in these moments to the divine gift of Jesus' peace and provision for everything that you have need, uh, that you have need of. And so Father, I thank you that we can come to you in the name of Jesus. Because of what Jesus has done, we can approach you. And thank you, Jesus, that when you were on the earth. You spoke these words to the people at that time, but they are words that you speak and direct to us today that we can know your rest, that we can walk in a, a burden that is light, notwithstanding that there are some burdensome things in this broken world. But I pray that each one of us and the people watching, whoever is in uh, just uh, situations where their peace has been uh, destroyed maybe or, or dismantled and, and there's, there's, there's no rest in their mind or their heart, in this moment I pray that everyone like that would turn their direction and their heart and their focus toward you and God that they would open up they would come to you they would respond to this simple invitation of Jesus to come to you and I pray your gift of peace would be deposited solidly in their heart and mind and whatever the situation is that they have focused on uh, that has stolen their peace that that you would intervene as well in that situation you are able and God, in the midst of the storm, as it may be right now, that still that rest, that peace, knowing that they are in the hands of Almighty God, they are being carried along, they are being provided for, you are leading and wanting to lead their life as they daily trust you. And may each one of us choose to trust you in every moment of every day, in every situation and in every way, O oh God. And out of that we know then that we will experience this gift of your peace and your rest that you have promised to us. I pray this in Jesus' powerful and loving name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Marlo and I'm one of the pastors here at Eaglemont Church. If you're exploring Eaglemont online, we want to welcome you. Please text the word welcome to the number below. We'd love to have the opportunity to connect with you. Uh, thanks for giving us that opportunity to help you find a place of belonging here in the Eaglemont family. We're so excited to let everyone know that next Sunday we begin our in-person gatherings, 10 a.m. in the facility where Eaglemont Church has gathered for over 13 years at the corner of 50th Avenue and 62nd Street. Uh, please go to eaglemont.church and read through the Frequently Asked Questions document that you'll see there. And click on the Reserve a Seat button as well. The, the Reserve a Seat button will be available, by the way, um, on the Wednesday prior to the Sunday that you are registering for. And uh, that will be available until Friday at noon uh, prior to the Sunday. Thank you so much for your attention to this. There is a cap on numbers in our uh, facility, so this step is essential to help us in our planning uh, to ensure that we're able to maintain the physical distance protocol in, uh, in the church building on a Sunday morning. Thanks for that. Eaglemont family, uh, thank you again for, your, uh, for helping the ministry and mission of Eaglemont Church move forward through your worship of giving. In April and May, our collective uh, general giving was down, uh, but June was, was strong uh, to the positive side, and so we wanna express sincere thanks to so many of you. Uh, you can give online at eaglemont.info by clicking on the Give button. 
And you can also drop off your offering uh, to the church office Monday to Thursday between 8.30 and 12.30. God bless you for that. And that truly is uh, worship to God. The second Sunday of every month, we bring focus to our collective giving for missions uh, over and above our regular tithes and offerings uh, to, uh, to Eaglemont. God's mission is the world. And so we believe that it's vital that we pray and give toward ministries and the work of missions around the world, which we're privileged to be able to do as a, as a church family. So way to go, Eaglemont Church, for, uh, for giving that way by choosing the missions general uh, from the drop-down menu on the giving page at eaglemont.info. Pastor Brennan will be leading a prayer gathering in the church parking lot tomorrow evening, Monday, July 13th, 6.30 to about 7.15 p.m. So bring a camping chair and your Bible. Uh, the most important place that we uh, need to gather is a place of prayer together where we can pray for one another and for the outreach and ministry of our church and certainly for our world in this day. Uh, so take time Monday night to pray together uh, in the parking lot at Eaglemont Church. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, be sure to subscribe to our Eaglemont Christian Church YouTube channel and uh, encourage you to sign up to receive our weekly email newsletter as well. Uh, you can do that at the bottom of eaglemont.info webpage. Enjoy the rest of the morning. Hello everyone from Vietnam. It's really good to be with you. Um, unfortunately, we were really looking forward to actually being with you, but unfortunately, because of everything going on, uh, we know that's not possible at this time, but uh, I'm still really honored to take this time together with you, share from my heart, share from the Word of God, and we do look forward to a day sometime where we can be re reunited together. And so um, I just wanted to say a big thank you to ECC family in general because you guys have been so supportive of us during this time uh, not only when our family moved overseas two and a half years ago but even now during uh, COVID-19 you guys have reached out to us with your prayers and with your support and you've let us know that uh, we are loved and we just really appreciate that because um, it's not always easy being on the other side of the world separated from family and friends and loved ones and so uh, your messages and your encouragement have really helped us through this time. So we just say thank you so, so much. And so we wanted to give you a little bit of an update about what we've been doing uh, over the past couple of months, especially during this time. And then we'll get into the Word of God this morning. Hello everybody, uh, we're Angela Kelly in Ireland in Southeast Asia and we just wanted to take a minute to say hello and to share with you what's happening here. Uh, we know looking at our calendars we're supposed to be with you here now in Canada but unfortunately because of global circumstances we're unable to. So how did we get to where we are today? We have been here for just over two and a half years and in that time, time has just flown by. We have been working hard to learn the local language and we have built a network of local churches and pastors and leaders that are passionate about reaching the next generation of their country for Christ. Less than 2% of the population here has a relationship with Jesus and religious persecution is very common in every aspect of their lives. 
But despite this, and because of the rapid development that's happening in the country, young people are starting to ask questions about their purpose and meaning in life. And this is why that one area that we have really chosen to focus on in ministry is uh, young adults and students. The city that we live in is one of the fastest growing cities in Southeast Asia. And every year, hundreds of thousands of students flood to the city uh, for better work and better education. And so we have a golden opportunity in front of us to reach people who are coming from all over the country. We partner with the local church to do outreaches in the form of English clubs on the university campuses here. We have the opportunity to build relationships with hundreds of students and then we work to plug them into the local church. These groups quickly become uh, communities of faith on the university campus itself. And then we get to work with those young people to help them get mentored and trained and discipled. And so we provide training for those young people on how to reach out to their friends, to their family, to the people in their dorms, to the people in their workplaces, and then we help them go do exactly that. And what's really exciting is that these students that we build relationships with and that come to Christ, they're from all over the country. And so they go back home and they share their new faith with their family and their friends in their hometowns. We've seen that this model is truly effective. And so we are looking for other churches to partner with and to use this model on different university campuses. Prior to that pandemic, we had the opportunity to put on the Alpha program with two of these groups. And through that, we saw dozens of people come to faith and even more get baptized. And so we believe that this is just the beginning of what God is doing here in this city, in this nation. With the recent global pandemic, our country was affected very early on and all of our schools closed in the beginning of February, including our on-campus activities. And so we had to transition to being fully online. Because of the seriousness of the lockdown efforts, our country has actually been quite effective at stopping the spread of the virus, and life is finally beginning to start to return to normal. Most of our English clubs have reopened, and all of our partner churches are able to meet in person again. However, we are only now starting to really understand the true economic impact that this situation has had on our students and their families. And so we are seeking ways that we can partner with local churches to support these local communities in need. Thanks to you, the love of God is being spread all across this country. And so we seriously could not do this without your love, your prayer, and your support. And so in the days ahead, we ask that you pray for, for us as we move into a post-COVID-19 world. Uh, and for all of our churches and our ministries that we are partnering with here in this country. God bless you guys. Say bye. 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 <laughs>So as you can see, we have decided to remain in this country and continue to partner with and serve the local church in order to raise up the next generation of leaders who are passionate about reaching their nation for Christ, uh, especially now during these very unprecedented times. And you know, that, that's kind of what I want to talk about a little bit this morning. Um, you know, I, I kind of hate myself for saying that word, unprecedented times, because it's something You've just been hearing over and over again, uh, these times are extraordinary, they're unprecedented. Uh, we're gonna be living in the new normal. And so I've made a rule with myself, not to, to try to purge them from my vocabulary, but uh, I'm gonna break my own rule here to prove a point in just a minute. Um, and I will explain. Now, th the definition of unprecedented is something that has never been done before or has never been known before but we know this this year 2020 seems like just a year of so many unprecedented things uh, the global pandemic um, civil unrest the culture wrestling with modern day racism um, and then there's political turmoil just so many things and oh don't even forget the economy just everything seems to be getting worse and worse and worse it feels like the world is on fire. This time feels unprecedented and different. And what I want to get at today is an important truth that I want us to hold on to, is that 
we have an unprecedented God who uses unprecedented times to do unprecedented things. And if we can learn just a little bit about that this morning, I think we can take that and it can encourage our faith and it can challenge us as to what our response can be during these unprecedented times. So let's look at that this morning. And as I was thinking about what I wanted to share, um, a, a story from Scripture has just been really sticking out for me over and over again these past few months. And it's from John 4. Um, in this chapter, we see Jesus meet the Samaritan woman. And I love this story because there's just so many things that every time I read it, we can pull out something new from it. But what I want to argue this morning is that in this passage, I see that Jesus does at least four unprecedented things that solicits at the end of the story an unprecedented response. So let's take a look at that this morning. You know, the, the first thing that Jesus does is he leaves his comfort zone. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me to John chapter 4 and uh, from verse 1. It says, Jesus knew that the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John, though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. Now, at first glance, that doesn't look like anything all that significant, but if we look a bit closer, we see Jesus was in Judea having a lot of success. His ministry was thriving. It was growing. He was doing good things. He was baptizing, making more disciples, and things were just going great. You could argue that it was a comfortable place. Good things were happening. Why leave? Why move on? But we read in verse 3, that's what he did. He left. Why wouldn't you stay? Why wouldn't Jesus stay to make more believers, more disciples, do more miracles? No, he left. He left a place of comfort. Now, what's wrong with comfort? Nothing on its surface, but comfort can prevent us from moving forward. You know, it's been said that Comfort is the enemy of progress. And you know what? When we're comfortable, we don't want to move. We're happy where we are. We're happy with the status quo. We're just good. And while there's nothing inherently wrong with that, if we don't look beyond the walls of our own comfort, what are we missing out on? And when it comes to our faith, I really believe that we are not called to be comfortable all the time. And I, I love this quote from Francis Chan. He says that God doesn't call us to be comfortable. He calls us to trust Him so completely that we are unafraid to put ourselves in situations where we will be in trouble if He does not come through. Wow. Wow. How can we put that onto our own lives? Am I just comfortable in my relationship with God? But it's really just kind of meh. It's just kind of there. It's not growing. It's not deepening. You know, maybe Jesus knew that the greater thing meant leaving that place of comfort. And I would argue that that's exactly what he knew. And so if we keep reading in verse 4, it says that he had to go through Samaria on the way. And so eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sikar near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. And soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please, give me a drink. And he was alone at that time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. Now, this journey from Judea to Galilee is an interesting one for me and I'm, I'm a bit of a history nerd so I like studying about what this looked like and so here's where I'm going to argue that Jesus did his second unprecedented thing in that from Judea to Galilee uh, you see the, the, in that time in the middle of that of those two places 
was this other place called Samaria. And Samaria and the Jewish people, they did not get along, to put it nicely. They hated each other. And so people, when they were traveling between Judea and Galilee, rather than taking the direct path straight through, they would go around the long way, uh, crossing multiple rivers just to get to the same destination, only so that they could avoid coming into contact with the people that they hated so much. And so it was said that from Jerusalem to Galilee took about three days if you went directly. But most people, if not everyone of the time, would take the long way, easily doubling the amount of time it took. Now, Jesus did the unprecedented, at least for his disciples, who must have been so confused. Why are we going through this area of people we hate? They don't like us. We don't like them. Let's just go around. But Jesus said no. Look at verse 4. It said, he had to go through Samaria. Meaning, it's a must. It was necessary for him to go. Why? Because he knew that there was something there that he needed to do. That if he would have gone the easy way, the normal way, he wouldn't have done. And so, thinking about my own life, I ask, how many times do I settle for the path of least resistance? The easy way, the default choice, where it's just, eh, it's a no-brainer, eh, I'm going to do that. The, I'm going to shut my mind off and I'm on the highway driving and when I get to where I'm going, I don't even realize how I got there. Um, but when you sit in that kind of comfort and in that easy way too long, you're not challenged, you don't grow. And when it comes to our faith, if our faith is never challenged, it grows weak. So what happens next? And this is where I say that Jesus then engages uh, with the next unprecedented thing of which he does. In verse 9, after Jesus had asked this woman for a drink, the woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. And so she said to Jesus, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? So Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. Wow. You know, the woman's response to Jesus here is kind of fascinating to me. She's confused. Why is this man talking to me? There are so many reasons at that time, culturally and historically, why those two should not have interacted with one another. Jesus was a man. She was a woman. Jesus was a Jew. She was a Samaritan. Jesus was a rabbi, a teacher, and this woman was probably a nobody, uh, maybe lower, lower class of society. There was no reason why he should have spoken to her. And she kind of responds back, maybe a little bit rude, maybe a little bit sassy. She says, you only are talking to me because you are thirsty and you want to drink. You know what? But Jesus didn't just brush off that and kind of end the conversation there. You know, he went deeper and he gave her an opportunity to know even more. He goes on to explain about this gift of God, this living water. He says to her, no, you misunderstand. You should be asking me for this living water. And you know what? This is where we get into the next and final unprecedented thing that Jesus does. So not only has he left his comfort zone and taken the path that was the non-easy way to go, and not only has he talked to someone who he should not have been talking to, but now he offers this person who isn't even sure why he is talking to her, but he offers her this gift, this most valuable, important gift of living water, and he expects nothing in return. I don't know about you, but that is unprecedented. Offering this woman, love, the love of God, the gift of God, God's salvation 
for nothing in return except for belief. We pick up again in verse 13. Jesus replied, Anyone who drinks this water at the well will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water that I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water and then I'll never be thirsty again. And I won't have to come here to get water. You know, I don't even know at this point if the woman actually got it yet or not. This could be a bit sarcastic. She could just be saying, ah, fine, you're not leaving me alone. And so, okay, give me this magic water and then I'm not going to have to come here tomorrow and put down my bucket and get all this water and go ahead. That's great. I'm good. Thank you. But, you know, Jesus doesn't even stop there. Okay, maybe she doesn't get it yet. Jesus goes even deeper and does even more unexpected. He says to the woman in verse 16, go and get your husband. What does that have to do with what they were talking about? I can only imagine how confused she must have been. And she she replied in verse 17, I don't have a husband, the woman replied. And Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband for you have had five husbands and you aren't even married to the man you are living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. And the woman said, wow, you must be a prophet. You know, I think this is the moment where she gets it, that Jesus was something more than what she thought at first. He was more than just a man. He was more than just her enemy, a Jewish man. He was more than just some random guy, a teacher, a rabbi. He was the Messiah. Could he be? And you know, she asked the question in verse 25. She says, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. So then Jesus revealed himself to her. He said, I am the Messiah. And you know, none of that would have happened had Jesus not done all these unprecedented things before. And so, so what happened? The, the woman, what was her response to this? And so, I love this. We read at the end uh, of, of this story in verse 27. So just then, after he revealed himself to her as the Messiah, uh, just then his disciples came back and they were shocked to find him talking to a woman. But none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? And so the people came streaming from the village to see him. There, I can't even imagine. There must have been such a transformation in this woman's way of thinking over the span of that short conversation that everything was different. You say the four unprecedented actions of Jesus led to this unprecedented response. She threw down her water jar, ran back to the village, of which she was probably ashamed to be because she was ashamed of who she was. And yet she told everyone who would listen, come and see this man. Could he be the Messiah? All because Jesus did the unprecedented the unprecedented things started to happen. And so that's where we come back today. Where does this leave us in these very much unprecedented times? How, how are you responding personally? You know, for many and, and myself included, I know during these times, they've not been easy. It, it's easy to, to be afraid, to be fearful, to, be, to doubt, God, are you really in the middle of all that's going on, all this chaos? So may I suggest that God is using this time globally, but maybe even personally in your life to challenge you to get out of your comfort zone, to trust Him more. Because when we leave that comfort zone, 
we have no choice to trust in him because if all if he doesn't stay true to his word we are done we have nothing left to stand on um, i feel that in my own life you know when we first got hit with all the messages coming to us from canada from the consulate and embassy here in vietnam everything was telling us you need to go home you need to go home the last flight is this day this day blah 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 and you know to be honest the comfortable thing would have been to just go home back to canada but we knew both angela and i knew that that was not the response god was calling our family to make and don't get me wrong we're, i'm not trying to play the martyr here we just knew that this is where God was calling us to be, to stay and to remain here. And I can tell you that even if you choose the comfortable things in your life and they're the wrong choice, they don't stay comfortable for all that long. The best place to be is right in the center of God's will. And so we knew that making the uncomfortable decision to, okay, we don't know when we could ever get back or what's going to happen here in a country where lots can change at the drop of a hat, but we know that we are going to stay and we're going to trust God through the middle of whatever happens. And so moving forward, it's not the easy way. It's not the way that most might have taken. But when we look ahead to our own lives, we see that God is calling our family during this time to keep moving forward, to keep striving, to keep working, even when it's difficult. And so ha what does that look like in your own life? Not just getting up from your comfort zone, but maybe challenging yourself, challenging your faith. You know, it's, it's far too easy to just sit on the couch and watch TV and, oh, I wish there were sports on TV. <laughs> I really do. Uh, but you can sit on that couch forever and nothing will happen. It's far more difficult to force yourself to get up off of that couch and do something meaningful with your time, with your energy, with your resources. Even if you don't have much of that, using what you have to serve God and to serve his church. And what about Jesus' engagement with this woman, this Samaritan woman. You know, by all of the standards of the day, that woman should have meant nothing to Jesus. And yet, he took the time, he went out of his way to connect with her, to show her why she was valuable, to show her that he had something to offer her. Who are those people in our lives? Who are those people in our life that might by some would be considered to be beneath us or not worth our time or so problematic that we should just stay away from completely. Maybe God is calling you today to reach out to some of those people. I don't know what that looks like. Every person is different. But I believe that there are so many people that we come into contact with. Maybe it's an old coworker, an old friend that just you've fallen out with. What if God was asking you to reconnect? What if there was a young person that just is struggling and not doing what they should be doing and yet nobody else has time for them? Do you have time for them? Will you go out of your way to show them love, care, and to show that you are willing to invest in their life? And finally gets back to this, this idea of what's really unprecedented in this story and in our lives is this unprecedented love that Jesus showed this woman. He offered this woman a gift of living water, this gift of salvation that she did nothing to earn, did nothing to deserve, and it changed her life. And that same Jesus is offering that same unprecedented love to you and to me this very day. 
The most famous scripture of all, John 3.16, says what? It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. I can't think of anything more unprecedented than that. That's unprecedented. You know, pandemics come and pandemics go. We can read about them in history, and yes, they are awful, but can't really say it's unprecedented. Economic turmoil, trade wars, culture wars, political tension, all of this is something to be concerned about for sure, but it's been played out through history time and time again. What is truly unprecedented is God, the creator of the universe, sending his son Jesus for you so that you could be in relationship with him, so that you could receive forgiveness for every way that we don't measure up, every way that we fall and stumble, and we can have an eternal life in relationship with God the Father, totally undeserved, I do nothing to deserve that gift, and yet Jesus offers it to me, and he's offering it to you. And the beautiful thing is that once we receive that gift, we, don't, we shouldn't keep it to ourselves. We go just like the Samaritan woman, and we take it back to every which way we go, everywhere we come from, as we do business, as we go about, we share that love, that unprecedented love with whomever. Now, for me and my family, God has called us to be here in Vietnam, on the other side of the world. But where has God placed you? God has placed you exactly where you need to be in this moment to do what He is calling you to do. It might not be comfortable. It might not be easy. You might have to get involved in uncomfortable situations and conversations, but God has put you there for a reason. He has shown you unprecedented love so you can go show that unprecedented love to all who are willing to hear it. And I believe that is what God is calling us to this morning or this afternoon or whatever time you're watching this on. Um, so. I just thank God for you all so much and know this, that you are loved by an unprecedented God who is working in these unprecedented times to do unprecedented things. God bless you. Once again, a reminder that our first in-person Sunday gathering will be two weeks from today, uh, July 19th. Uh, so please go to eaglemont.church to see the important details for what that will look like. There's also a video there, a three and a half minute video that is a bit of a walkthrough to give you an idea of what things will be like with the uh, protocols in place as we, as we gather. Uh, just a reminder to reserve your seat, as we said before, uh, at eaglemont.church. Um, the reserve a seat button uh, will be available from Wednesday to Friday at noon prior to the Sunday that you're registering for. And thank you so much for your attention to this. Again, there's a cap on numbers, so this step is essential to help us in our planning um, re regarding the, uh, the distance protocol that we, we uh, want to adhere to and need to ad adhere to. If you want someone to pray with you this morning over the phone, uh, we encourage you to text, invite you to text the word prayer to the number below and someone from our prayer team would be happy to call you and pray with you for whatever is on your heart and mind uh, today. Also, if you made the exciting decision to surrender your life to Jesus today, we would love to hear about that. Let us know by texting the word Jesus to the number below and this will give us the opportunity to, uh, to help in any way you feel is uh, valuable, to come alongside you, to give you some resources that, uh, that will help you grow in your new relationship with Christ. So thanks for being with us today. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday.